Well, thank you for joining us again for another edition of the Mind of Christ. We're going to continue our study today uh, in the parable section. Uh, if you're following A.T. Robertson, this is section 64. It is a very, very long section. And this is, I think, our third recording uh, in this section. It won't be our last. And uh, so we've been, we've been uh, considering a few things about the parable. We've been talking mostly about uh, the explanation that Jesus is giving to the apostles that are, that's found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 and following. Uh, and, and so today we're going to kind of get back to the parable itself um, and look at part of it. We won't look at all of it. Uh, and, and get into some detail. Now remember that in the very first part of Matthew 13, Jesus gives the parable, then he gives some explanation of why he speaks in parables, and then he's going to give an explanation of the parable itself, which uh, starts in verse 18. So we'll be kind of jumping back and forth between uh, Matthew 13, 1 through 9, and um, Matthew 18, Matthew 13, 18 through 23. And we may even go out to Mark and Luke and get a few things too uh, to help us have a complete understanding uh, of this section. So anyway, thank you for joining us today and we will jump into our study. This is a in-depth study of, of God's Word and so uh, you may want to hit the pause button uh, or you may want to uh, take notes, a uh, number of things that you can do to get all the good out of this. So back to the actual parable itself, uh, the parable of the sower uh, and its explanation. The seed sown is the word of the kingdom, according to chapter 13 and verse 19. Mark simply says the word. Luke calls it the word of God um, in Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. Does Jesus have in mind the entire Bible? And in addition, any other type of, quote, word, audible word, the word from nature that reveals God, the conscience of a person, examples of others who are living out the word. What all does he have in mind here? Well, I'm just asking the question because we're, we're thinking here of what are we sowing into the hearts of people? Others who are living, I'm um, sorry, the designation kingdom is the only specific other than it is a word that if sown in good soil produces a crop. It is also a word that can be sp uh, stolen by Satan. It needs roots to grow and it can be crowded out by worries and wealth, uh, noting the emphasis of what Jesus himself and John preached. Uh, the gospel of the kingdom, including the mandate to repent and believe in the one who had been sent and to be baptized. And it seems clear that the word has much to do with conversion, dying to self, growth. All of that seems to be obvious is included in the idea of sowing the word of God. It is also clear that uh, th that there are words in God. Uh, there are words in God's word that can be understood and applied to our lives without producing any significant value to salvation. What we're going to learn here is, is there's, there's certain words that we apply to our lives that never result in anything to do with our salvation because they weren't applied in the right way. We must be sure we plant the seed that has the power to save and to transform we got to be sure what we're actually planting in someone's heart because we can plant things in people's hearts that may be right and they may be good and they may be true, but they may not be transformational. They may not be uh, uh, have the ability to save people. There is a critical moment or moments in our lives when we hear the word. If it does not produce understanding at that moment, Satan or some satanic influences, is ready to remove it so it can't do its work. But in one sense, it is doing its work. It is separating one from the other, the uh, insiders from the outsiders. Matthew chapter 10, the critical moment occurred 
when the apostles knocked on someone's door. Many get more chances. Um, many get more chances than just simply one knock on the door. Though I wonder if there is a law of diminishing return sometimes. Some get one chance and they make the most of it. Jesus' attributes or attributes the actions to the evil one. In other words, the birds that come down and take the seed off of the, off of the pathway soil, he attributes that action to the evil one. Uh, it is poneros, P-O-N-E-R-O-S. Uh, it, um, it is used here with a definite article, the evil one. Matthew chapter 13, verse 38, Jesus says that the tares are the sons of the evil one. In Ephesians 6 and verse 16, it speaks of the flaming missiles of the evil one. In 1 John 2, verse 13, the, the uh, young men have overcome the evil one. And also again in verse 14. In, jo in 1 John 3, and verse 12, Cain was of the evil one. Uh, Cain who killed his brother. In uh, 1 John 5, and verse 18, the one who is born of God is kept by God and the evil one does not touch him. The actions of the evil one is described as snatching away, snatching away, harpazo, H-A-R-P-A-Z-O. It means to seize, to catch away, to pluck, to pull up. We get the word harpoon from this Greek word. It's appropriate. Large fish and mammals are harpooned, a spear with a line attached to it, in order to pull them out of the, uh, of the s safety of their element, uh, in, like water, in order to destroy them. Uh, Neptune, or Poseidon, has a, a trident or a three-pronged spear, like a pitchfork, but totally diff for a totally different purpose. It's also used in battle as a weapon. In Jude verse 23, our job is to try to save people by snatching them out of the fire. It's almost like we're trying to harpoon them, pulling them out of the fire. A contrast to Satan snatching the word from the soil. Our job is to snatch people out of danger. Satan is snatching the word of God out of people's hearts. In John 10 and verse 28 and 29, the sheep who hear Jesus' words, his true sheep compared to the disciples uh, to whom the secrets of the kingdom were given, are, a, are in possession of eternal life. They have a knowledge of the Father and the Son, and they shall never perish. And no one is able to snatch or to harpoon them out of the Father's hand. The Father's hand is comparable to the seed in the good soil. It is a place of protection where someone can grow. In verse 29, the Father is greater than all, stronger than the strong man. Once those, um, once those bound the strong man have, uh, have been released, um, once they have bound the strong man and they've been released from him, then they're given to Jesus and they're kept safe in the Father's hand. And our Father is strong enough to keep us from being stolen and possessed again. But it can't just be a cleansing. It must be a filling up of, of uh, or up lest seven more demons stronger than the first come and set up, up shop in your or my life. And so when we are snatched out of the fire, when we are put into the hands of God, uh, we then are in a state of protection. But when Satan comes and he snatches the word of God out of our hearts, then we're vulnerable and we're and in danger. In John 6, 15, 
uh, when the crowds wanted to take Jesus by force and make him a king, they were trying to harpoon him. They were trying to control the sovereign Lord to rule the king. They wanted to rule the king. It's the word harpoon there, or harpizo. Um, in Acts 8, verse 39, the Spirit snatches away Philip after uh, the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, Acts 23, and verse 10, uh, Paul was taken by force out of an angry crowd for his safety. You see this idea of harpazo, the snatching away of something. It's, it's usually some external uh, force involved. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 2, a man, uh, probably Paul himself, was snatched up and caught up to the third heaven. Um, in verse 4, it was caught up to paradise. He didn't fly. He was pulled up by force outside of himself. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17, at Jesus' return, uh, someone is going to be caught up into the heavens. Uh, when Jesus returns, this is often called the rapture, which really comes from a, um, a Latin word. Uh, but it's a Latin word that's translating this word harpazo. Revelation 12 and verse 5, Jesus is called up to God in that particular text. So the catching up or the snatching away there is an external force, in this case in the parable, it is Satan who is snatching the word of God out of the hearts or, of, of, or the hearing of the people. It's also interesting that even though the pathway soil is harder and the birds eat it off the surface, Jesus says it is still sown in the heart. Uh, Matthew 13 and verse 19. Hard hearts have a level of understanding. But there is two levels of understanding, or there are two levels of understanding. One mere understands the concepts or the words. The other is convicted in their understanding, a combination of word and faith with the convicting work of the Spirit involved. Now, the rocky soil has not much soil. Jesus stresses the immediacy of the response. Immediately, they sprang up. And so, when he talks about the rocky soil, he says the the seed falls on that soil. It has a little bit of soil there, and the plants immediately spring up. But he seems to indicate it was because the soil was shallow that they sprang up quickly. How can shallow soil cause seed to germinate quickly? Well, I checked this out, and the web confirms that seed germinate quickly, generally in shallow soil. But the key is whether there, uh, there are rocks under the shallow soil or more soil. The reason is, is that the warmth of the, uh, of the soil, uh, where it is a place where warm, uh, it is warm and seeds can grow faster as long as other factors are present. Could the rocky soil person be responding to the, uh, to the warmth, if you will, of Jesus? Jesus being likable, new and exciting, but they're not really listening to him. The, you know, Jesus probably was a kind of a charismatic, charismatic person. Uh, at least his personality was one of, of the love and the, and the concern and the care he had from people. People were attracted to him, but perhaps um, they didn't listen very deeply to what he has to say. So Jesus says that the man hears the word or the logos and receives it with joy. Uh, this idea of joy means with cheerfulness, with calm delight, with uh, rejoicing. In Matthew 13 and verse 44, concerning the man who finds the treasure in the field, it is from joy over it that he goes and he sells what he has and he buys the field. Jesus knows us. There is an initial joy or excitement in many first encounters we experience uh, in many first encounters with all kinds of things that we immediately have a, a joy about, oh, I found something wonderful or I've heard this new artist or, you know, we're like that. We, we immediately uh, experience some joy, uh, uh, temporary joy in something. We experience this daily in some newfound uh, band or store or car or organization or job, whatever it is. But we are, we're over it pretty quickly. 
Occasionally, you will see someone latch on to something and obsess over it, a hobby, a group. It's usually because we attach our identity to it and, and, um, and bond so tightly that we can't imagine detaching from it. It's common in psychology. Uh, it's, it's called attachment theory. I want to consider how this plays into our attachment to Jesus. From immediate joy to lifelong following, even um, uh, uh, so how, how do we go from this idea of, of immediate joy to a sustained lifetime following of Jesus? How do we stay attached to him? Jesus describes the, the problem with the rocky soil man. He has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. No root in himself. What does that mean? Well, Ephesians 3 and verse 17, Paul urges his readers in prayer to be strengthened with power through the Spirit in the inner man. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love, this idea of being rooted and grounded, uh, it, he's getting at the same idea here, is, is that um, uh, you don't want a temporary grounding in Christ. What a, what a rich correlated passage pulling together the elements of the work of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Jesus, uh, love and faith, all occupying in the inner or occurring in the inner man. All of those ingredients coming together. Uh, and, and so if you, see, um, if you see these elements there that he's describing in Ephesians 3 verse 17, then you will see what it takes to, for the seed of the Word of God to actually uh, find its proper uh, place, the good soil, so that it can grow. Colossians 2.5, Paul speaks of the, their uh, stability of faith in Christ. Uh, twofold, receiving Christ and secondly, walking in Him. Um, is do and These are doable because one is firmly rooted. A firm root is essential to continued growth and production of fruit, to the stability of the, of the plant. If you don't have a firm root, the plant is not going to last. Uh, others mention other mentions of the word root. In Matthew 3 and verse 10, John talks about the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Trees not planted in Jesus, but in tradition. They're going to be cut down, uh, even at the root. Mark chapter 11 and verse 20, it talks about the fig tree that was cursed, was withered from the root up. In Romans chapter 14, uh, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verses 16 through 18, if the root is holy, the branches are holy too. The rich root of the olive tree, the root supports you. The branches do not support the root. The root is so important. And so this this seed that fell upon the uh, rocky ground could get no, it could not be rooted. Romans 15 and verse 12, Jesus is the root of Jesse. When the tree was just a stump, the root was still good, and Jesus sprang up. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Hebrews 12 and verse 15 mentions the root of bitterness springing up within us. Revelation 5 and verse 5, the root of David is mentioned, and 22 and verse 16 as well. The root is foundational to the plant. It is key. How do you recognize whether the word of God that you, uh, that you speak is really taking root? In other words, when I speak the word of God, how do I know it's taking root in a person's life? The person who is hearing me speak, how do I know that? Is someone really hearing it, understanding it? Jesus uses the word temporary. Um, it means for the occasion only, for a while, endure for a time, for a season. It's temporal. How true. We can be so into something for the occasion and so quickly cool off and forget and dismiss it and walk away. This is the, God does not want occasional Christians. He wants us firmly rooted 
for all time. Matthew 13, verse 21, Jesus uh, gives a couple of specific causes of the rootless Christian. The first is, is affliction, and the second is persecution because of the word. Well, what is affliction? Uh, the word for, uh, for affliction means pressure. It means to a uh, it means a, a narrow place, something that is a, a, a causes suffering or tribulation. In John chapter sixteen and verse twenty one, it compares to childbirth, the anguish. And so, when a child goes to the birth canal, there is affliction. There is a narrowing process that causes suffering. But rem remember, it is no more. Uh, but after we're afterwards, it can be remembered no more, and and the the mother returns to joy. Um, this is kind of the opposite of, of Matthew 13. There is no recovery in Matthew 13. Instead of temporary joy, we have temporary affliction and a return to joy in this particular case. In 2 Corinthians 2, 4, Paul wrote out of much affliction and anguish of heart because of of their situation. In Acts 7 and verse 10, in speaking of Joseph, who was rescued by God out of his afflictions and granted wisdom and favor in the sight of Pharaoh. In Romans 5 and verse 3, goes as far as to say that we should exult in our tribulations because we know that they produce perseverance, character, and hope. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 4, Paul adds that we are comforted by God in all our afflictions. Hebrews 10, 32 and 33 speaks of those Christians who endured uh, reproaches and tribulations. Also notice in verse 32, uh, 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 conversion is called uh, enlightenment, a point when the light bulb goes off and we get and we get into a person, we get a person who hears the word and expresses joy publicly. Um, But but then it, but then when that happens, when they when they uh, um, receive the word and they have great joy, it calls attention to themselves, and it invites uh, scrutiny and criticism and perhaps scorn and ridicule by others, and so there may be someone who immediately receives the word of God. They get excited about it, and then they they start rejoicing about it and telling people about it and then somebody comes along and pours cold water on them uh, you know just simply criticizes them and say are you crazy or you you know uh, and it it just takes it takes the joy out of what they they have found this pressure makes one question themselves as to whether they really are smart to believe in Jesus if they're um If their, quote, purchase or acceptance or commitment was really wise, they may be questioning that. As we say, it is like pouring cold water on someone or raining on someone's parade. Luke adds the word temptation as a cause of falling away. Um, and so, and we've talked about the idea of temptation uh, in, a, in a previous uh, message back in the temptations of Jesus. Matthew's second word is persecution. So one is affliction. That can cause a person to uh, grow up quickly and then fall away. The other is uh, persecution. The word persecution means to chase. It means a pursuit. Um, I can't remember where we talked about this before, but I, we've covered that before. But it is similar to affliction in that others or circumstances crowd in hard. Uh, uh, they crowd in um, that the, they may hurt us into a more confined space when at first we feel less free and more stifled. It is the press to stay conformed to the world instead of being transformed. Note that the persecution has some relationship to the word. It is not merely a, a streak of bad luck. Accepting the word of God and believing it may cause persecution. Perhaps a warning label is needed. Jesus did warn his apostles of this. Uh, read John 14 through 16. 
those uh, three chapters, and, co and connected this with the need and the responsibility of the Holy Spirit to be in our lives. Do we warn folks how hard following Jesus can be if we only stress the blessings we have only told half the truth? The term falls away in this text makes uh, may evoke in us a theological issue about the possibility of a person losing their salvation or falling from grace. This involves the Calvinistic doctrine of perseverance of the saints. But is this passage describing a saved person? This person hears the word and receives it with joy. Does this equal salvation? Well, not necessarily. But how do we know? And was Jesus even trying to describe exact points of savedness in this text. We have often interpreted this, or interpreted this parable to say only one of the four are saved. Well, I doubt, uh, I doubt uh, our percentages, but the idea of falling away does seem to imply someone falls away from, secu from something. So what do they fall away from? If not salvation, what? From their study of the Bible? From their interest in Jesus? Are they really disciples at this point? Currently, we have a, a young lady at church who, was, who has studied God's Word and is being uh, prevented or delayed from baptism because her mother, who is Catholic, uh, thinks her decision is impulsive. And so an arbitrary date has been set to see if she is still uh, serious about the matter. So far, she's sticking to her guns. So what is the truth here? Is this young lady a disciple yet? The context here is hard, but what of other places, like Galatians chapter 5? Those who are obviously saved people, who go back to a salvation by law approach, fallen from grace. To go from one place to another, you have to move from one to another. So at least... Uh, here, this man falls from joy to despair, from embracing the word to now distancing himself from the word. The word in Greek for falls away uh, is, a, is a word that means offended. We get, we get the word scandal, uh, scandalon or, or a scandal from it. It is offended. It is used 13 times in Matthew. Um, let me just run through those uh, with you quickly so you can have them at hand. It's found in Matthew 5, uh, 29 and 30 about your if your eye or your hand make you stumble, then you are to either pluck out the eye or cut off your hand. In Matthew 11, verse 6, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. In Matthew 13, 57, at Nazareth, uh, his hometown, they took offense at him. Matthew 15, verse 12, the disciples tell Jesus that the Pharisees were offended by what he said. In 1727, Jesus paid taxes so not to offend the Romans. In 18 and verse 6, uh, talks about causing little ones to stumble or to be offended. Uh, Acts uh, 18, 8 and 9, again, back to the hand and the foot and the eye uh, causing someone to stumble. In Matthew 24 and verse 10, many will fall away uh, um, or be offended because of Jesus. Matthew 26, verse 31, Jesus tells his disciples that they will fall away because of him, fulfilling scripture. In Matthew 26, and verse 33, Peter says that he never will fall away. And Mark uses this too, eight times. Luca uses it only two times. In John 6, and verse 61, at, uh, at his hard teaching, some people fell away. Jesus uh, says to his disciples, uh, does this cause you to stumble? Are you offended by what I say? In John 16 and verse 1, Jesus warns, uh, warnings were told, uh, warning was to, uh, he warned people in order to keep them from stumbling. He warned them that something was coming. In 1 Corinthians 8 and verse 13, eating meat causes someone to stumble. Boy, there's a lot of places where this word is found. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 29, Paul feels concerned for those who are falling or stumbling. Scandalon. It's, move, it's a movable stick or a trigger or a trap or a snare. 
It's an impediment that causes stumbling. So in Matthew 13 and verse 41, Jesus will send forth his angels to gather out of the kingdom all the stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. In Matthew 16 and verse 23, Peter is called Satan, uh, is called state, Satan, a stumbling block to Jesus, not setting uh, his mind on God's interest, but on man's interest. In Matthew um, uh, 18 and verse 17, the world, it talks about the world's stumbling blocks. Romans 9 and verse 33, quoting from Isaiah 8 and verse 14, when righteousness is not pursued by faith, they miss who Jesus is and stumble over the stumbling stone. He becomes a rock of offense. In Romans 11 and verse 9, quoting from Psalm 69 and verse 22, In Israel seeking, not by faith, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes and ears that do not see or hear, and their uh, table became a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution. The Jews falling appear... Uh, I'm sorry, the Jews falling away opens a door for the Gentiles. In Romans 14 and verse 13, determine not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. In Romans 16 and verse 17, watch out for those who do put stumbling blocks in people's way. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 23, Christ, is, Christ crucified is a stumbling block for people and is foolishness for some. In Galatians 5 and verse 11, circumcision is a stumbling block uh, to the Gentiles. 1 Peter 2 and verse 8, uh, it talks about stumbling because of disobedience. In 1 John 2 verse 10, love removes the stumbling stone. There's just so many places where this idea of stumbling or falling is found. And the reason I give you all this is to show you that that when he talks about people who fall away on account of the word of God, is, is that he is talking about a very serious condition that all of us are prone to. The nature of falling away seems closely tied to negative consequences, consequences associated with knowing Jesus. Though these consequences can extend to death, persecution, ridicule, being ostracized, loss of financial stability, and being prevented from social upward mobility. For many, to be connected to Jesus was not a plus. It carried huge risk, and when confronted with those risks, many caved and stumbled over Jesus. I'm reading a book called Influence, and it's interesting that social, that social proof, um, people taking cues uh, from their social environment to determine their behavior. How much looking around at your, at your fellow crowd members determines your reaction to Jesus? We tend to act like others around us. For those who accepted persecution, a new social paradigm was set which attached people to following Jesus. But the scale had to be tipped before the kingdom grew. Commitment begets commitment. Seeing people living out their faith encourages us, gives us courage to overcome our personal objections. Jesus was a great social scientist. He knew human behavior. In other words, what we're saying here is, is that in those earliest days when people were being persecuted, I believe more people were stumbling over Jesus. But as the momentum began to switch, and more and more people began to be persecuted and accept that persecution and showed their commitment to Jesus, the easier it was for other people to get on that and put their faith in Jesus. Well, the third kind of person is the one among the thorns. Matthew, um, uh, Mark, and Luke all add something to this picture. Matthew only says that the seed fell among the thorns, choking, choking out the seed. Implied is the plant um, produced by the seed. Mark says something similar, but adds it is the word that is choked. Luke adds that the thorns grew up 
with the seed and chokes it. So we get the picture of them growing together. But Luke also adds, as they go on their way, the choking begins. The thorns are, uh, are in, identified as, uh, by Matthew as the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth. Mark identifies them as the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things that enter in. Luke simply says, worries and riches and pleasures of this life. The outcomes are that Matthew says that the word becomes unfruitful. Mark says the word becomes unfruitful. And Luke says it brings no fruit to maturity. All these need to be compared. The action of choking is, um, is a word, let me see if I can say it, some Ping go, S U M P N I G O. I'm not sure I said it correctly. It means to choke utterly, to press round, to throng so as to almost suffocate them. It is only found in this context. There's no other place that this word is found. Weeds or thorns generally compete for nutrients in the soil. Perhaps because they outnumber the plants, they choke off the supply that gives life. The life energy gives, given by Jesus is diverted to other things. We use the energy he gives us for other things. This choking is not immediate. It occurs over time. <clears throat> as, they, as they go on their way or pursue the uh, journey on which they have entered, then worries and riches and pleasures happen. Excuse me. The worry of the world. The worry here uh, is a word that means uh, is is merimena, m e r i m n a. It uh, means anxiety or concern or worries or worry. It's used in this context, and also found in Luke chapter twenty-one and verse thirty-four. Be on your guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipations and drunkenness and the worries of this life, and that will dry, and and that day will come on you suddenly like a trap. Well, the idea of dissipation is is the idea of giddiness, and um, and headache caused by drinking wine to excess. So he's saying that. Basically, don't get drunk and have a hangover. Uh, Paul carried this anxiety for all the churches, he says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 28. Peter tells us to cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for us. So the world is the culprit. Its influences crowd in and take our attention off of what is important. The word world here is aeon, A-I-O-N, it's not the word cosmos. It's an age or a time, that which is presently happening. Matthew 12 and verse 32 says that blasphemy of the Spirit will not be forgiven in this age nor in the one to come. So there's a number, number of places where this idea of ages um, is used. But all ages of human existence carry with it the the. Uh, in the moment or in the real time, uh, the challenges of survival which can breed anxiety and worry. So the second culprit here, or the second weed, is deceitfulness of wealth or riches. Um, the old self is corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Um, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22 Colossians 2 verse 8 says that we can be taken captive by philosophy and empty deception. So again, there's this, there is this um, idea of deception or deceit that we must understand that Satan's tool is deceit and wealth is one of the ways that he captures us in this deception. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 10 says that those who are vulnerable to the deception of wickedness are those who do not love the truth. And then in Hebrews 3 and verse 13, the deceitfulness of sin hardens 
but daily encouragement protects us from this. 2 Peter 2 and verse 13 speaks of those who revel in their deceptions. But, but specifically here, it is the riches that deceive. Abundance of external possessions. God has riches which are, with which we are blessed. Romans 2 and verse 4, the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, which leads us to repentance. Romans 9 and verse 23 speaks of the riches of his glory. The failure of the Jews resulted in the riches for the world or for the Gentiles. Romans 11 and verse 12. Romans 11 and verse 33 speaks of the riches of the wisdom of the knowledge of God. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 2, Paul says it was out of their great poverty that they found that that flowed great riches into their lives. Ephesians 1 verse 7 speaks of the riches of God's grace. And 1 in verse 18 mentions the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. All of these places of that where riches are mentioned, there's so many, I'm not going to give all of them to you today, is it, it, it causes us sometimes when we are presented with worldly riches that we, we come to devalue the true riches that God is giving us in Christ. Um, and so Mark adds not only the riches, but he adds the, the desire for other things. Literally, um, about the other things, desires. In other words, there's not only riches, but there's other things besides riches that we desire. So the idea of desire here is a common word for desire. It means cravings. And it's, it's used in various places to talk about the lusts and the cravings of the hearts. And so caught up in our lives is this idea of the things that we long for, the things that we crave. And if those things are not primarily the kingdom of God, the, the wisdom of God, the righteousness of God, the goodness of God, then we're going to be deceived by those things and we're going to fall away. So the desire for other things would be those things not in conformity with the will of God. Luke 8 and verse 14 uses the idea of the pleasures of life. Uh, here, the, the, this, I, this phrase uh, is akin to Titus 3 and verse 3. It talks about uh, a person who is enslaved to various pleasures. James chapter 4 and verse 1, the source of conflicts and quarrels are pleasures that wage war in your members. In chapter 4 and verse 3, we do not receive what we ask for because, uh, because we simply want to spend it on our own pleasures. 2 Peter 2 and verse 13, talk of those who love uh, and those who love or count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, reveling in their deception. All in all, the thorns that choke out the word are pernicious. Are, these are no ordinary thorns. These are mean, entangling, piercing. And though we normally avoid thorns because they are painful, we seem drawn to these even though they suck the very life out of us. The deception is quite complete. Like a moth drawn to the burning flame, we we worry ourselves to death, spend ourselves to death, party ourselves to death. Jesus seems to perfect, per, to perfectly describe the modern society in these words. Jesus can say so much in so few words. The result of the thorns is unfruitfulness, uh, used with Matthew and Mark. Luce says it brings no fruit, fruit to maturity. Um, it means to be a bearer to completion, to ripen fruit, to bring fruit to perfection. It's only used here figuratively. Uh, to be fruitless means to be barren. Uh, and it's a word that's used 56 times, mostly in Matthew and Luke. And so one of the things that's clear from the scripture is, is that God wants people to bear fruit. I'll just give you a a couple of examples of this. In Matthew 3 and verse 8, we are to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. In Matthew 3 and verse 10, if you don't bear good fruit, you'll be cut down. 
Uh, of course, the John 15 passage that talks about bearing fruit or branches that do not bear fruit will be cut off and thrown into the fire. And Jesus is looking for fruit that will last. God is so desperate or desirous for fruit that he makes it clear it is essential in our relationship with him. In fact, it is the evidence of our relationship with him. Jesus inspects fruit. He expects fruit. The, he produces fruit. The person who does not produce the fruit of the kingdom is worthless. Not inherently, but practically so. So the things listed that rob us of fruit are to be feared and cleared out of our life. They rob us of of our blessing. They choke out the life source of Jesus's nourishment. They make it impossible to experience the full and abundant life that he desires for us. It is critical to remove the thorns, ASAP. Well, we're gonna stop right there. We're not gonna talk about the good soil today. We'll talk about that next time, but we'll stop there because uh, that's just enough for today. We've gotten through three of the different kinds of soil that are talked about, and you've gotten a lot of information, and I hope you will um, take time to dig deeply into it so that you can understand the mind of Christ. Until next time, God bless. You can go to our website, centralsarasota.org. Find all kinds of things there for your listening enjoyment. Take care. God bless.